All right, so we are wrapping up chapters two and three, the seven churches of Revelation today. And I don't know if you remember this, but going all the way back to the very first message, we looked at the church of Ephesus, and it was a message that I preached as well to get things going. And the title of that particular message was Pursue Your First Love. Pursue Your First Love. That was the exhortation to Ephesus. But then as we're at the last church now, this church of Laodicea, I wanted to bring it back again because really what this church is being told and being warned about is that you need to pursue a relationship with Jesus. You need to pursue something beyond just the outside or the vestiges or some other semblance of what it means to know God. You need to actually have a relationship with Jesus himself, which actually should be our first love. And so on many, in many ways, it's kind of coming back all the way to the beginning again, which is actually how these seven letters have been revealed uh, to the Christians of that time and is being received by us today. So if you kind of see these seven churches, they started with Ephesus, then we went clockwise to where now we're at Laodicea, the church that's closest to Ephesus. So we're back full circle again. And when you look at these seven churches, uh, they're churches that are all in the same general vicinity, so that people knew each other, but then there are also churches that had their distinctives in terms of their, their city strengths, uh, their city's uh, interests, their city's uh, culture, and with each one then there's a word for every single church for all time, for every single Christian for all time, and that's where we find ourselves. Now there's different pieces too in these letters that we can connect with and kind of draw threads through. And these pieces include these, that there's always a beginning revelation of some aspect of Jesus Christ. Because he is the one that is speaking to the churches. And he's the one that in chapter one reveals himself in this magnificent way. There's always a way by which then the revelation speaks to a part of that and points to it. And every single one is intentional. Then there's a praise oftentimes. In fact, in every single letter to the churches, there's a praise for something they're doing well, except for today's. There's not going to be much of a praise. And you'll see that in a moment. And then after that, there's going to be a criticism. So you did well in this, but here's where you've fallen short as a church, as the people of God. Then there's a way by which you can address that. There's an application. Do something about it in this way. And then finally, there's a promise. And so you will see those pieces if you think back to the previous messages throughout all of those letters. But then today, we're going to see it kind of all wrap up, but then missing a really important part. And I think what's missing is going to speak loudly, and I'm hoping that it will speak loudly to us. Now, a little bit about Laodicea, and I'm pointing out these things a little bit intentionally because you're going to see it specifically addressed, okay? So Laodicea is a city that is in the middle of trade routes, and it's a crossroad where everyone has to go through to get business done. And so this is a wealthy city by virtue of its location and by virtue of its busyness. This is a city that, in fact, is so wealthy and so self-sufficient and so independent that there was an earthquake that happened in 60 AD, and this is all part of the Roman Empire, right? They rebuilt the entire city with no help from the Roman Empire. So imagine, I mean, we just had all these natural disasters throughout the course of the summer. Imagine if the government didn't have to step in to rebuild like New Orleans when they had this crazy hurricane or up the coast to New York, the same hurricane. Imagine the government's like, oh, you guys got this. You'll take care of it. No city could have handled the rebuild. But this was a city for which a giant earthquake leveled the city and they rebuilt it themselves on their own funds with no help from the Roman Empire. So this is a self-sufficient, extremely wealthy city that is centrally located to where they maximized their potential in that way. There were beautiful buildings, there were beautiful temples, uh, but really they could build anything they wanted. And so there was a lot of things that just really made that city feel strong. In fact, it is. Now the city was also known for a few specific things. They were known for producing this really silky, soft, black wool that was uh, great for wearing and great for whatever it is you wanted to make it into. So they made this clothing-like material uh, that was uh, well-traded and, and well-desired. Also, they had this medical bent to them, to where there was a school of medicine there. And in that school of medicine, one of the things they were most known for was like this medication for the eye. Uh, it became so famous that it actually was a medication that became known for that region, Phrygia, that they actually called it this like ointment from Phrygia that was good for the eye. And so this is just a city that's not only wealthy, but also kind of on the frontiers of doing a lot of things that people of the region desired. And 
that's what Laodicea is known for. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind of how strong the city is, of how resourceful this city is. And then within the city, there were some Christians there. There was a church there. And then this church is receiving this message from Jesus. Okay. All right. So let's look at the, the, the aspect of Jesus that is lifted up here. And today's passage is uh, verses 14 to 22. So I'm just going to work my way through it because it does go in that order of where those segments that have appeared in previous letters continue to show up in a similar order. So this is the display of Christ in verse 14. And the angel of the church, and to the angel of the church in those here, right? This is Jesus. The words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Okay, so three parts. You see this. The amen. What is it? Well, we say amen at the end of our prayers. Why? Because pretty much we're asking God, please make it so. Please make this happen. God, please hear our prayers. And may it be true. So pretty much, if Jesus is the amen, he is the one that makes things happen. He is the one that makes God's will come true. Okay, so he is the source of certainty. He is the sovereign God who is able to exert power and allow God's will to be done. He is the amen. Secondly, he is the faithful and true witness, which, sure, is not spectacular in and of itself. We know that about Jesus. But keep in mind, again, the contrast then that this would play to the city of Laodicea. So Jesus, who is speaking to them, declares himself to be faithful and true. Let's see if that kicks in later when he's talking to Laodicea as to how they are. Finally, he is the beginning of God's creation. So he is the greatest. Now, he is not creation. He is creator. And Colossians 1 addresses this. Incidentally, Colossae is one of like the cities that's nearby Laodicea that kind of gets grouped together with Laodicea. And so the letter to the Colossians would have been a letter that would have been familiar to Laodicea also. And we're reminded in chapter 1, verses 15 and 17, this is said about Jesus, and it makes a lot of sense when this is declared about him. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, thrones, or dominions, or rulers, or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. That's why he is God. It's for him. Okay? He's not just an agent of creation that God is using. He is God himself. It's for him. And he is before all things, and he in him all things hold together. So Jesus is the maker of everything. He creates things. He assigns value and worth to those things. Again, keeping in mind what Laodicea is known for. Okay. But Jesus is the one that makes things happen. Jesus is the one that is faithful and true. And Jesus is the one that assigns ultimate value as creator to anything that God has made. So that is the Christ that is before us then declaring this message. So I mentioned that the second section usually is some kind of praise or commendation. Here's what verse 15 says to start. I know your works. And then crickets. So Jesus is not ignorant. Jesus knows everything about Laodicea. He knows their hearts. He knows their actions. He knows their deeds. And crickets, no praise, none at all. So we should move on as well. Goes right into criticism, starting in the second half of verse 15. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Man, it's like this verbal attack on the church in Laodicea. Now, a little bit more about Laodicea, where they're located. They have all kinds of wealth and business and traffic, but what they don't have is good water. And so what Laodicea has had to do is they've had to import hot water from the city called Hierapolis. So it's like piping hot six miles away. And they've had to import pure drinking water from Colossae, 10 miles away. So if you can imagine hot piping water six miles away coming through an aqueduct, or whatever it is that the Roman technology had at that time, which incidentally, there's still aqueducts that exist today in the Middle East. If you go to Israel, you will see aqueducts. It's an amazing thing how durable those buildings have been. Six miles in, the water's not hot anymore. It's lukewarm. 
Along the way, it's gathered all kinds of minerals. It's kind of accumulated and kind of picked up in its flow, all kinds of stuff that are just not delicious to drink. So if you take just water that's been piped in and it's the Laodicean water coming through their pipes, whatever it is, you know, the metaphor coming through their sources, it doesn't taste good. It tastes a little gross. And if you drink the wrong bite or not the wrong cup, you know, wrong sip, you'll want to throw it up because it's just, if you can imagine just whatever it is that is tasting, it's, it's not a good thing at all. And so they know this, but the connection that maybe they never made was that Jesus said, that is your spiritual condition. Now, when I was, um, you know, going through college, one of the favorite songs that we had, a vineyard song was, uh, don't let your love grow cold. I'm crying out, light the fire again. That's actually not accurate, even though it's based on this passage. It's okay that your love is hot. It's okay that your love is cold. But when it's lukewarm, it's gross. That's pretty much what he's saying. Hot water is useful. Cold water is great. Warm water with minerals in it, without filtering, disgusting. The Laodiceans knew this. But yet, Jesus is saying, this is your spiritual condition. The, the cup of water that you don't want to drink, that's you. Man, that's harsh. That is definitely a criticism. Now he goes on to list then a few descriptions of what this looked like in life. So what do they believe about themselves? These, no, don't forget, these are Christians. So I'm not just talking about Laodicean citizens. These are Christians who live in Laodicea. What do they believe about themselves? They're rich, they have prospered. That's not wrong. That's true. That's resume. No problem. But here's what they believed about that. I need nothing. They have everything. Their spiritual condition is one in which they need nothing from their view, from their hearts. It's one of those things where you're sitting in your community group and you're going around, hey, what are your prayer requests for this week? Nothing. I'm good. Life is perfect. But you actually meant it versus you were just shy or you're just humble or you don't want to share it actually is nothing. You're like, dude, you wish you were me. That's them. They needed nothing, but it's not because they had this depth of relationship with God or this depth of maturity in their understanding of things or, or this like, you know, pro prolific uh, set of ministries that is really making disciples everywhere. And it's like, you can't stop them. No, they're just looking at the stuff in their hands, in their portfolios that they're sitting in, walking around, able to enjoy and going, that's it. I'm set. I'm a Christian that is basing everything I need in life on this. I'm set. So then here comes further criticism. They are wretched and pitiable. Wretched and pitiable, that means actually they're miserable. They're in a bad situation. They're about to enter, if not already, in the middle of suffering. They're, they're not to be envied at all. You're wretched and pitiable. You're to be felt sorry for. And then they're poor, blind, and naked. They're wealthy, but yet poor. They make eye medicine, yet they're blind. They make black wool to wear, yet they're naked. Man, you know, Jesus is going for the jugular. He's not holding back at all. He does know them, and he calls them out. So what is the application? Verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. They definitely need counsel, okay, because they're very confused. They're very blind spiritually. So that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. So this is counsel. Everything, Laodiceans, that you make and you make well, that you're famous for, that you're number one, you need the spiritual version of that from me. You need to have what you can't make from the one who can give you what no one else can. You need to come to me to receive the value and the worth and the preciousness of the things that really would actually satisfy your soul. The things that Ian shared today about the things that he wrestled with. It's not saying that some of those things that are good in this world are bad. His struggle, as he shared honestly with us, 
was when he found ultimate worth in those things instead of finding greater worth in what God has to give. And I'm not saying this to call him out. It's because he shared it. I'm saying this because this is not abnormal, guys. Your collegians, many of you were raised in the church. You'd be lying, most of you, if you're able to say, oh, yeah, I've never wrestled with these aspects of my faith. Of course you have. Of course you have. I did. And so though the scenes are a dangerous situation, this is then Jesus' counsel for them. Come to Jesus for true and lasting satisfaction. This week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, there was a trailer that came out for The Matrix. Matrix resurrected. You know why? Because the first one came out 20 years ago. I got the DVD of The Matrix for my wedding gift. Okay, so I just want to throw that out there. It is old. So maybe a lot of maybe the, the cultural connections are, are not easily picked up. I mean, if you kind of saw it through that time, there's just certain things, red pill, blue pill. You hear it, you're like, I get it. But here's a little bit of a summary. And I don't know what the new thing is going to be about. I'm sure it's going to be interesting. I'm curious to see it. But it, it, there's something about actually watching when it came out. You're like, well, blew me away. But there was this, this guy named Morpheus. He offered this guy, you know, played by Keanu, a red pill and a blue pill. And that was kind of the beginning of the movie in terms of then the, the destiny that he chose and the direction that he chose. And the Matrix is, anyway. So this is what he said when he offered the red pill and the blue pill. He said, this is your last chance. Neo, after this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. So the idea is that the world that he lives in is not the real world. There's this matrix, right? And then he's offering deeper insight. Morpheus is often deeper insight to Neo. If he chooses to take it, that is the truth. That's what Jesus was doing with the real deceit. Because you are spiritually blind. Because you are proudly self-sufficient. Because you are insanely serious in this belief that you don't need Jesus and you're a Christian. You're satisfied with the things that your eyes can see and that your hands can make and that money can bring. You live in an alternate reality and you need to come to me. I counsel you to come to me. Now, there's this one part that, uh, a little bit of a twist here, but I like it. Verse 19, it's application. But believe it or not, it's tucked in there something a little bit more. Verse 19, says this, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. So the action is to be zealous and repent. We'll get to that in a moment, okay? But the first part of this, I actually want to suggest to you is the hidden praise for the church of Laodicea. This is hidden, not in a weird way, but it's not in a clear way. That's why it's hidden, okay? What does Jesus say? Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So you work yourself backwards. You know what? Bad things may happen to you in this process of being disciplined. So Christ will discipline this church of Laodicea. Okay? But let's look at the first part. And here's the hidden praise. Those I love. Did you expect Jesus to say that? Be honest. Looking at the church of Laodicea, you've forsaken me. You do not care about me. You're calling yourselves Christians. You could care less about following me. You're basing everything in your life based on everything that will disappear. Why should Jesus love you? Why should Jesus love the Laodiceans? This is the praise because Jesus didn't just hit them upside the head and go, get out of here. You're not mine anymore. I mean, the warning is there that if you continue in this, certainly beyond rebuking and discipline, you're going to go astray and you're not going to be a church and you're not going to be Christian anymore. He's not saying 
that there's not a cost. If you actually forsake Christ, you can actually forsake Christ and leave. But he's saying that first and foremost, he loves his church. And this letter to the church and the Odyssey of it, there are people there that he loves. And if he loves them, they will hear him. And if he loves them, guess what? It's not based on how well they loved him. He loves them not because they were the good church that did the many things that the other six churches did. It's not that they were faithful. It's not that they helped people. It's not that they were sacrificial. It's not that they were persecuted. According to Jesus, they did nothing. But here's the praise, which gives all glory to Christ. Those I love is not out of reach. It's not out of hope. It's not out of change. It's not out of transformation. If I can look at you and say, I love you, Laodicea, you will zealously repent. Interestingly enough, you think, okay, zealous and repentant, why is it in that order? Isn't it kind of makes more sense like you repent with zealousy? Is that a word, zealousness? No, that's jealousy. You repent with zealousness? Thank you. Oh. Very smart. No, no, but it's zealously leading to repentance. Zealousness leading to repentance. Why might that be? It's because maybe they know this, but they don't care. You can't be a church for that long and kind of think, you know what, I don't need Jesus and I'm in the church. I mean, how long are you live that life, right? So they probably know these things. They probably know they need Jesus. They probably know that the things in this world won't last forever. They probably know that, you know, if they don't follow Jesus, they, you know, what's the point? You know, it's just a sign on the door, like, we're just a church, who cares? They know this, but there's no zeal. There's no passion to pursue this truth. So that's why there's no repentance. Repentance begins with a renewing and transforming of your mind, what you want to do. Then you repent. Repent is actually going the opposite way, walking away from where you came from. It's an application. Repentance is an application of a decision. And for them, without zeal to pursue Christ and to follow Christ and to go to Christ, there is no repentance in action because it's not needed to them. Being extremely comfortable is exactly where they want to be, regardless of what they know. So be zealous, take your faith seriously, take what you know to heart and pursue it with passion. And guess what happens? Repentance, a change of mind leading to a change of life. Now I want to talk about the first part again about those whom I love. A lot of times we have this cultural myth where our relationship with God is related to our circumstances in life. That if bad things happen to us, that maybe God doesn't love us or we did something wrong. But then if great things happen to us and everything is smooth and school is great and my friends are close and my family is not fighting and, you know, I have a car, I have a job, I have school and I'm doing okay, then I must be in God's favor. You know what that is? That's the prosperity gospel. That's not the Jesus gospel. The Jesus gospel is one in which God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not because we deserve it and not because we earned it, but because he loved first so that those who would believe in him through repentance and faith will not perish but have everlasting life. Those whom Jesus loves doesn't mean that those will be the people that have the smoothest lives, easiest decisions, happiest relationships, pain-free physical conditions. Those whom Jesus loves are just simply those whom Jesus loves. And those who calls to repent and to take his faith, take their faith seriously. 
Let's look at the promise. Verse 20. Behold, by the way, there's an immediate promise in that it's more, you know, like short term, tangible, not short term, like it doesn't last, but it's something that can happen quickly. And then there's more of an eternal promise here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. This is the more immediate promise. How many of you guys have heard this verse before? I'm sure you have. Now, how many of you guys have heard it in the form of a, like a tract or a gospel sharing kind of thing? Okay, some of you. Um, but if you look at the context, uh, this is a verse that is not primarily trying to reach non-Christians per se. It's actually talking to God's people. And you can see the language, right? And again, I, I love this side of Jesus. The way that he shares. I mean, the way that he sets up Laodicea, you would think that this is actually the church that he comes in with a lightning bolt on. He doesn't. He, he, he is lowly and humble. Jesus comes to the door. Knock, knock, knock. Family, are you home? I know you're home. I'm outside of fellowship with you. I'm not in your life. But I love you, your family, you've trusted in me. Will you let me into your life? He is so humble that it is so stark of a contrast to the criticism because he knew their hearts, but his approach was one desiring relationship and intimacy. He wanted to be with them. So, the beautiful thing about zealousness leading to repentance is that it's actually a response and a pursuit of this relationship that Jesus is continuing to initiate with you. If he loves you and you knew this, and that's why you followed him in the first place, he's not left you. He's at this door that you've put him outside of, that you felt in your life, you did not need him to live. You did not need him near you. And he's asking if you can hear him, and he's asking if you will receive him. He can break the door down. He chooses not to because he loves you and because this is what it looks like to be zealous and to repent is to respond to Jesus. I want to share this quote with you by a commentary author, Grant Osborne. He says this to expand on this idea. Thus, the promise here is of acceptance, sharing, and blessing. A deep fellowship with the one offering forgiveness and reconciliation with God. That's a beautiful thing. That is the picture that is being given as an invitation to the church of the Lucia. There's nothing sweeter than table fellowship for Middle Eastern culture. We relate to that too in the Asian culture, right? How do you fix things? Have a meal together. That's what we do. They, they do the same. So to have a table fellowship means not that everything is perfect, but that there's enough love and trust to be at the table and let's work it out. Let's work it out. Now, the promise that goes into eternity of the verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Now we're looking at the end of Revelation where as God restores and makes the new heavens and a new earth and people will reign with Christ, you will receive what ultimately is going to be given to the people of God. The Christians of Laodicea will be like all the Christians of all that have trusted in Christ, that have waited for the hope of his return, that have been redeemed because he has been raised once and he will raise us again. We will reign with Christ. He is already the victor, but for eternity, he will reign and will reign with him. So here's the call. To the people know this yeah here's the call to all of us verse 22 he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches and i want to end this way i want to end with 
uh, an expanded passage. I had referred to it earlier in Colossians 1, 15, 17, but I want to read all the way to verse 20, uh, if you don't mind, and then take us to the application questions, because I think the focal point of this passage, as it was for every single letter to the churches, is Christ. When we look sideways, when we look just at a temporal, finite life that we have and the things that we could accumulate for the now, we lose sight of Christ. Jesus, in calling to every single one of these seven churches, pretty much begins with, hey, look at me. Look at me. You're my people. Look at me. And then listen to me. So I want to end these seven letters by looking at Christ again so that we can see, well, how then are we responding to this Christ as we're in our community groups responding to the questions? Feel free to close your eyes. Feel free to look in your own Bible. But I just want you to try your best to, to put into imagination and understanding and to soak in this picture of Christ that we're called to put our gaze on. But not only that, to zealously pursue and to actively repent towards Apostle Paul said this, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. That's us. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, the most important among all things. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, beginning with Christians. He reconciled sinners like us to the Father through his death and resurrection, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Let's pray together. Father God, we ask, Lord, that you will shake us and wake us up, if needed, just like the church in the Odyssey, who have chosen at that time to pursue a path that was godless and Christless with no bearing on eternity and no outflow of their salvation at all because they naively believed, sinfully held to, and ignorantly based their livelihoods on the works of their own hands instead of you who made everything. And so God, if we need to be shaken awake, if we need to be jolted tonight in our seats, in our hearts, and in our minds. Please do that so that we could get a clearer look at Jesus, the creator God, our Savior, resurrected, will return to die never again and to raise your people into eternal life, to reign with you never to die again. May we have our gaze upon Christ tonight. Wake us up, shake us in our seats, and help us to be zealous about our relationship with you and to repent in our walk and our decisions after you. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us first. It is not because we earned your love that then we deserve this word. We don't deserve anything, but you loved us first, just like you did to the church in Odyssey, whom have turned their backs on you in many ways that you saw. And those you love, you pursue. So help us to respond to your love and help us to humble ourselves at your feet. In Jesus' name, I pray.